All right. Well, welcome. Man, got a good crowd tonight. Great day. Um, it's good to see y'all. And uh, if you were here this morning or else if you weren't here, I guess more particularly if you weren't here this morning and trying to see the live stream uh, service, for some reason, uh, and, and the church was not the only one affected, the, it was, the Comporium was having some internet issues this morning apparently because uh, we had n no internet service at all, and so we got it up there now. It's, uh, um, we recorded everything and then just posted it later, so uh, it's there now to, to see, but couldn't do it live. So hopefully tonight our internet will, will hang in there with us and we'll be able to, to get through our Bible study. Uh, we were having some conversation before we got started tonight. Uh, I spoke with a few folks. Just um, Tonight is going to be interesting. Uh, our, our scripture that we're going to be looking at is in Revelation chapter 10 and into verse uh, chapter 11. I had initially uh, thought about breaking this up into two, but uh, I decided to try to keep it together into one uh, coherent section because... What we're looking at tonight is going to be the, uh, the time or the, the moments between the sixth and seventh trumpets that were, are blown in, in Revelation. And so it's kind of a, it's what's called an interlude, like the second interlude between, it's almost like a break in the action. So rather than break this up, I thought we'd keep it together. And uh, tell you what, let me go grab one more thing, uh, some notes here that I've got. You'll see when we get into the text, you'll see um, the way the story goes, it mentions, it mentions the seventh trumpet that it's coming, and we're going to stop... Our goal is to try to go from chapter 10, verse 1, to chapter 11, verse 14. And that's right at the end of the interlude, right before the seventh trumpet happens. So that's our goal. If we, if we don't get that far, we'll just stop and, and uh, we'll pick it up next time. But uh, that's where we're looking tonight. And this is, I'll go ahead and warn you ahead of time. There's... Uh, there's several spots in here where there is some very uh, symbolic language that references other prophecies. There's going to be references especially to Ezekiel's prophecy and then also some to Daniel and one to Zechariah. And so because of the nature of the connection of what's happening here, uh, just about everywhere I read the authors, the commentators, all these other scholars would say, well, there's this many different ways you could look at this, and so there's no way to tell for sure which one is the right one, but from all appearances, it looks like it's this. And so there's several different instances where that happens. So we're going to just go through it, and uh, you'll see when we get there, um, we're not going to be able to say this is definitely what it is. Okay, so we're, we're not in a position to be able to know. And, and that's okay. It's okay to, to just say, hey, God knows more than we do. It's his plan anyway. And so however he, ha however he has it planned, it's going to work out that way. So we can trust that, that he's got it under control. So let's go ahead and read through the text. And uh, then we'll just walk through it and talk about it. And then we can discuss uh, the, the details and hopefully understand... Uh, what's being said here. So this is uh, Revelation chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun. His legs were like pillars of fire. He held a little scroll or small book opened in his hand. He put his right foot on the sea, his left on the land and he called out with a loud voice like a roaring lion and when he cried out the seven thunders raised their voices and when the seven thunders spoke 
I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders said, and do not write it down. Then the angel that I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by the one who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, there will no longer be a delay. But in the days when the seventh angel will blow his trumpet, then the mystery of God will be completed as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take and eat it. It will be bitter in your stomach, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I ate it, my stomach became bitter. And they said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. And then I was given a measuring reed like a rod with these words, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count those who worship there. But exclude the courtyard outside the temple. Don't measure it because it's given to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1260 days dressed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, Fire comes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. And they have authority to close up the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. They also have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. And when they finish their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the main street of the great city, which figuratively or spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And some of the peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will view their bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their bodies to be put into a tomb. And those who live on the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. Great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. At that moment, a violent earthquake took place. A tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is coming soon. Now, I'm guessing that None of you are really just sitting there at this point saying, oh, well, that makes perfect sense to me. I, I totally understand, right? Because uh, that's, uh, that's a lot to take in and, and understand. Uh, where we left off in chapter 9 last week, that was the summary of the fifth and sixth trumpets being blown by those angels and, and the result of that, the consequences of those two things. And then now you see this, uh, this time period between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, and that's what we've just read. So let's just kind of take a look at what we've got here, and uh, hopefully we can make uh, some degree of sense out of it, enough to understand what God wants us to know. And that's really, that's really the goal tonight. We, uh, we don't want to try to know more than we're supposed to know, but we want to know everything we need to know, if that makes sense. You know, and, I, and I'll probably, uh, I should probably reference a couple of, a, a, a couple of uh, Scripture passages to maybe to um, guide us through this tonight, and especially in the weeks ahead going through Revelation. 
There's two passages of Scripture, both of them in the Old Testament, and uh, they kind of help us understand, maybe put our mind at ease a little bit about what we're supposed to be able to figure out when we read Scripture, especially this part of the Bible. The first one is in Deuteronomy 29, 29, and you can just listen as I read them. If you want to jot those references down, you can do that, but Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The hidden things, or the secret things, belong to the Lord our God, but the revealed things belong to us and our children forever, so that we may follow all the words of this law. So that kind of helps us understand there's just some stuff we're not supposed to know. Okay? But there, the things that we do know, he says the revealed things belong to us and our children forever, so that we may do all that's in this law. What God gives us is enough to where we can be obedient to him and, and do his will and follow his word, live a life like he wants us to live. Okay, but we don't have to, we don't have to know everything. And uh, sometimes that's a relief, and other times it's kind of, well, I would like to know about this, but you know, uh, we're, maybe we're just not supposed to. Now, the other passage that's uh, been very uh, comforting to me over the years is found in Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, and really in verse 10 and 11 too. But here's what Isaiah wrote. Uh, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways, says the Lord. Just as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so just that portion speaks to, hey, we just can't understand everything God has got going on. But then he says this in verses 10 and 11. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and don't return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to the sower and food to the eater, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I please and prosper in that for which I sent it to do. So God's word is going to accomplish its purposes uh, even if we don't know it all or understand it all, uh, God promises to tell us what we need, not necessarily what we want to know. So hopefully that's a comfort uh, as we look at this. So, so let's look at Revelation 10 to start off with. Uh, John sees another mighty angel. And, this, and, and when I say mighty, I mean this, this angel's got one foot planted on the land and one in the sea. Like I mean this... I can't even get my head around, you know, what kind of sight he's seeing. Uh, a, an angelic being that is that uh, magnificent, that large. Wrapped in a cloud, it says in here. A rainbow or halo over his head. His face like the sun, his legs like pillars of fire. And he's holding a book in his hand and it's open. Now this corresponds to Ezekiel. If you were to go back and look at Ezekiel at the end of chapter 2, uh, about in verse 9 and through the first parts of Ezekiel chapter 3, you'll, you'll hear or read the same type of thing. It's the same picture. It's kind of a corresponding prophecy. And so this angel, as I said, had a, has a foot on the land, a foot on the sea, and he's calling out. His voice sounds like a lion. I mean, this is just a, an amazing scene. And uh, John is doing his best as the Spirit has inspired him, to help us get a... I mean, we can't even really get a, a vivid picture in our mind. We don't have much of a reference point or a comparison to what does that look like? What does a mighty angel of that size... I mean, what does that even look like? To have a foot on the land, a foot on the sea, and a rainbow, and uh, a face like sun, and pillars of fire for legs, and uh, a voice like a roaring lion... It's just, uh, it's just amazing to, to try to imagine what that looked like. But then when he speaks, the Bible says there are seven, uh, like a peal of thunder. The, it says the seven thunders speak when the angel calls out. And John apparently, now, now look, at, look at this. Verse 4 says, when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. Okay, so that helps us understand that whatever happened... Whatever uh, sound or whatever message came, 
John understood something because it says he was about to write it down. So obviously he had something he was going to write. So whatever, whatever the, th the seven thunders, whatever that is and whatever they said, he had some information he was going to write down until a voice told him. A voice came from heaven, it says in verse 4, saying, seal up what they said and don't write it down. And then it just stops right there and goes on to the next event. So we don't get a, a picture at all of what just happened. We, we know something was said, and John was about to write it, and he was told not to. So for whatever reason, that's a prime example. Uh, he was about to give us more information, and the voice from heaven said no. So for whatever reason, we're not supposed to know what that was. Okay, maybe, maybe one day we will, maybe we won't, but we can rest assured. Remember what I said this morning? We were talking about, and this is the scripture from Psalm 91 that I read at the very beginning of our, our service this morning. Uh, the psalmist said, I'm talking about God being his refuge and fortress, and he said, my God in whom I trust. Remember that? We can trust God. So, in my opinion, that's all it is, but I know God, if I know God can be trusted, then I don't have to worry about what those, what those thunders said. I don't have to worry about John not writing it down because I can trust God with whatever, whatever it was, I'm not supposed to know it, so it's okay. But it did seem odd. It just kind of struck me that uh, whatever it was, we don't get to know what that is. And then in verse 5, you see, he just goes right on. See, John says in verse 5, Then the angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand. So now he's making an oath. This is a picture, an Old Testament picture of uh, swearing an oath. He's raising his right hand to heaven. And, and imagine, remember the, the scale here we're talking about. This is the angel that's got a, one foot on the land and one on the sea. So huge, raising a hand to heaven. So again, I can't imagine the scene of what John is beholding here. But he says, he swore by the one who lives forever and ever. This is, he's swearing by, by Christ. He lives forever and ever, created heaven and earth and the sea. This is our creator God, our, our one God in heaven. And listen what he says. There will no longer be a delay. But in the days when the seventh angel will blow his trumpet, then the mystery of God will be completed. So, here's what we have to look forward to. Remember, this is between the sixth and seventh trumpets. And so we know now... That whatever's about to happen when that last trumpet is blown, the seventh trumpet, whatever that is, uh, whatever it is entailed by the, the mystery of God, it's, it's going to come to an end. It's going to be completed, okay? Because that's, that's a, a, a promise here of what John has, has seen in his vision, what the angel has said. He's sworn an oath under God. There won't be a delay anymore. When that seventh angel blows his trumpet, the mystery of God will be completed as he announced to his servants the prophets. So now, here, here's what the picture we have right at this point. John, in, this, in Revelation, is serving the purpose of a prophet. And he is also included then in the same category as the Old Testament prophets like Ezekiel, like Daniel, like Zechariah, these references that are overlapping here between Revelation and these Old Testament prophets, that's, uh, that's what's being referred to here when this angel swears that oath and says, just as he announced to his servants the prophets, he's channeling all these together, all the counsel of God that's come through the years, uh, all recorded here for us, Whatever overlap, whatever uh, commonalities exist between those previous prophecies and this one here, this vision, it's all going to come to a completion. Okay, It's all going to be fulfilled, whatever that looks like. And remember I said at the beginning, we, we're going to have to say on some of these things, we're just, hey, what, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how that's going to work out. But whatever it is, it, it's going to come to a completion. Okay, We know that for sure. And so then the voice that John had heard from heaven, spoke again, told him to go get the scroll that's in the angel's hand, and he takes it in verse 9, and he uh, is told, 
to take it and eat it. Now, and this is one of the things that I discovered uh, doing a little bit of uh, research into that because that just seems interesting to me. Now, the exact same thing was said in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, he was told to eat the, eat the scroll. And, and you see there's a, a contrast between the, um, the taste and then the effect. I guess that's the best way to put it. He says the taste is going to be sweet like honey. But then when you when he gets into your stomach, into your insides, it's going to be bitter. So so here's one of the one of the things I read as a, a possible explanation for that. When we take the message of God, when we take the gospel, and we um, we uh, digest it, so to speak, when we first receive the gospel, it's sweet. It's called good news for a reason, right? It's a sweet message, but it carries with it consequences, good and bad, right? So when you, when you take the gospel message, what are we supposed to do with the gospel? We're supposed to give it away, right? We're supposed to share it. So what, what are some possible uh, consequences of sharing the gospel message? Some people will receive it gladly and, and be just, just feel like they're indebted to you for bringing them such good news they'll be so thankful for hearing the gospel some people though will have just the opposite reaction won't they some people will be offended they will reject the message completely and they'll be offended at you personally for being the one who who shared that message with them so there will be some bitter consequences for, for digesting the message. And what I mean by that is when the, when the gospel, this is, a, this is a, a very symbolic image, I think, of, of taking this word and eating it to where it's not just received, but it's, it's in you. So what happens when, it, when the gospel gets in you, what's that supposed to signify? It's supposed to, to show that uh, the gospel is now, uh, it's part of who we are. And so wherever we go, the gospel goes. Uh, whenever we have conversation, the gospel kind of overrides our conversation and kind of uh, gives us uh, guidelines within which we're supposed to interact with people. So uh, hopefully, when I have the gospel uh, just dwelling in me, part of who I am, then my conversations with people, even if they're on other subjects, on something totally unrelated, they're going to be informed by the way the gospel works in my life. Does that make sense? So I'm not just going to talk to somebody just without any, uh, without, uh, any experience of the gospel coming through that. The, my, my tone of voice, my personality, the way I uh, treat other people, the way I interact with other people the conversations I have, it ought to all be influenced, that's the word I was hunting for, influenced by the gospel, right? It ought to be part of, part of us, for better or worse. So when somebody uh, appreciates us because of the gospel, that's great. But we can't be surprised when we share the gospel and we're not appreciated. We're, you know, quite the opposite. We're, you know, we're, they're offended. They don't like us anymore, you know. Uh, I can, I, I've had those. I'm sure some of y'all had too. When you talk about inviting people to church or telling them about Jesus, and they, you know, Charles, you shared a few weeks ago that, that very experience, someone you tried to invite to church, and they like they don't want any part of it, right? And some people are going to react that way. And, and that's, that's okay. We just have to know that's part of the deal, right? Not everybody's going to appreciate it. Some people are going to reject it. So John ate the scroll. It affected him just like the angel said. But then, what's the last verse in chapter 10? Look, look at the way. It, does it say this in your translation? They. Does it say that in verse 11? They told me. They said to me. Yeah. So, so isn't that interesting? It's been this angel said this, 
this voice from heaven said this, like individual, but now it's they said to me. It's almost like a, a joining together, a, a uh, consensus, so to speak, saying they said, hey, John, you're not done. You, you still have, you got to do some more prophesying. And then uh, we move into chapter 11, and that's uh, kind of a, a turning point in the interlude, at least, because you're moving from John personal experience to now we're talking about some other people getting involved so you move into the two witnesses the two what is what is the phrase the two witnesses what does that mean is that literal is that really two people that are going to prophesy because you know that's that's been the um, a popular uh, understanding of that that it's two people and uh, I'll get to that in just a minute in a little bit more detail. But then, or is that symbolic? Does it more uh, indicate there's going to be uh, witnesses that represent larger groups of people like the church and the witness of the church and the people of God? And is it going to be more worldwide or is it going to be focused in a particular place? And I'll tell you why uh, it's harder to kind of pin that down here in just a minute. So you get to ver uh, verse 1 of chapter 11. John was giving a measuring reed like a rod, and he's told he needs to go measure the temple and the altar and count the people who are worshiping. He needs to exclude the courtyard outside the temple and not measure it because uh, the Bible says it's given to the nations and they're going to trample the holy city for 42 months. So what does all that mean? What's he measuring? What is the temple and the altar? What does that count? Well, I, I brought um, one of my resources in here because there's several parts I did, I'm trying to to type and cut and paste, I thought, you know, I'm just going to bring this book in here and point out a couple of things that hopefully will be helpful because there are some, there are uh, lots of different views about what is going on here. So what does the temple of God refer to and the altar and those who worship? What is John really being asked to do? Okay, so when we read into this, um, we're talking about uh, an Old Testament passage. And so the, the popular scholarship to this point says that most, it says most people are agreeing that the Old Testament picture that John probably had in mind when this was told to him was if you go back to Ezekiel and you look at Ezekiel chapter 40, from chapter 40 all the way into verse, uh, chapter 48, there's a lengthy description of the measuring of the future kingdom temple. And Ezekiel speaks exactly of that. And so most people are agreeing that that's the picture John probably had in his mind when he was told to go measure the temple of God and the altar and to count the worshipers. But... What's, what's happening here, as we move through this chapter, the first part of this chapter 11, is there is a distinction uh, what John's task uh, is really about is making a distinction between those who are holy and those who have defiled themselves by worshiping this beast that we're talking about, the, the major conflict here in Revelation between those who worship the Lamb, who, who follow Christ, and those who, uh, as we'll see, receive the mark of the beast, right? They worship the world, okay, and the, and the temporary ruler of the world. And, and you see this as you uh, get into this chapter a little bit more when it talks about the two witnesses and the, uh, the beast that comes out from the abyss. And so we're talking, we're getting a picture of the devil here, okay? A picture of the devil. And those who are devoted to him and... Uh, rebellious toward God. So, what we're seeing here in this temple, altar, and worshipers is um, the temple representing the church within the Great Tribulation. And there are some issues with that understanding of it. So, just know that as we finish up here in chapter 11, uh, in this first part of it at least, just about everything I'm going to tell you right now is going to come with the little caveat that says probably, but we're just not sure. Okay, that, that applies to everything we're about to say. Okay, Because this is just the, the, the most sense we can make of what we have here. So 
the church in the midst of the great tribulation as the temple, represented by the temple, which means the altar would refer to the huge stone altar of sacrifice that's in the court of the priests. And what these represent symbolically are the true servants of God, and then the measuring task that John is given is symbolizing their recognition and acceptance by God, just like the same uh, numbering that took place back in chapter 7 about the 144,000 where we talked about it's, well, it's 12 tribes, but it's not, a, it's not the same 12. You know, some of them were, were changed and the different mentions uh, in that list and it wasn't a strict number, 144,000. It was more like uh, that's uh, representative of the people of God. Okay, so that same type of concept is happening here. So when you get past that first part, now we're talking about what, what's happening with this, uh, this outer courtyard. Why is he told not to include the courtyard? And he says, uh, the Bible says, uh, not to include it because it's given to the nations and they're going to trample the holy city for 42 months. And this, this brings up, I'll just go ahead and tell you, this brings up a pile of different issues, okay? So we're going to try to just walk through them the best we can. In the mind of John, uh, the holy city refers, just like the temple, refers to the church. And the consistent usage of that expression, the holy city, means the community of those who are faithful to Jesus Christ. And at this point in, hi in church history, it's composed of believing Jews and Gentiles. So that was, one, that was a neat little overlap coming into this after we just talked about today and last week in Acts about how the gospel is now going to the Gentiles. And so this church in Antioch, like we talked about this morning, was one of the first churches in the New Testament that was composed of both Jews and Gentiles, which was not the norm. Okay, So we've got a lot of uh, symbolic imagery here. These phrases, the temple, the holy city, referring to the church, the people of God, believing Jews and Gentiles. And so this reference uh, is to the people as they must first endure the trampling of the pagan nations for 42 months. And when we get into these, these um, designations of time, here's something interesting that happens. So you got, you know you've got this, uh, this reference to time that's popular in Revel Revelation that's mentioned a lot, this period of seven like seven years or seven days and so then you've got 42 months well you know what 42 months is half of seven three and a half years and then it mentions uh 1260 days well you know what that is 42 months of 30 days apiece okay uh three and a half years so there's a lot of uh there, there's some some uh intentional uh I'm going to have this measurement, but I'm going to call the same thing like three different, three different things. And it's going to all refer to the same thing. So we've got uh, persecution. Uh, is that what we're talking about here for this 42 months? Is that what's going to happen to the people of God? Is that why we're talking about tribulation and persecution? That the nations, the unbelieving nations, because that's what, you're, that's what the, the word typically refers to when you have the Gentiles... Those, that used to be a term to say the people without God, right? So the nations used to be, you had the Jews and you had the nations. So the nations were the ones that didn't have God. And so in this sense, now you've got, remember, we've come all the way through the New Testament. So now we've, the whole Gentile thing, that's, that's, we're seeing that in Acts. That's in the past tense now, okay? So now the gospel's gone to the Gentiles. Everybody who believes in Jesus Christ is in the people of God. Okay, so that's the context that we're in here in Revelation. So now, when we see the nations trampling this courtyard, now we're talking about the nations referring to all those who don't belong to God, who have rejected the gospel. And they're going to persecute the people of God for this period of 42 months. Okay, so we, we keep walking down here through this text, and now you see in verse 4... Uh, I'm sorry, verse 3, the two witnesses that God is going to grant authority 
to two witnesses, and they're going to prophesy for a period of time. So what in the world does this look like? And, and I read, I read and read and read, and, and I kept saying, well, this person thinks it means this. This person means it think, thinks it means this. And then, you know, you got half a dozen different views, and every one of them are making pretty fair arguments. And so it's hard to tell. Now, I will tell you one you might have heard that uh, is a little bit more popular. Uh, some have said over the years that these two witnesses are literally two witnesses, two people, uh, and, and that it's Moses and Elijah. Others have said it is Enoch and Elijah because, you know, Enoch and Elijah were the two that, that got taken up. You know, Elijah went up in a, a chariot of fire in a whirlwind, and Enoch, it says it was, he was taken. He was no longer found because God took him. So they didn't actually die. They were taken up. And so some people think, well, that's who it is. But Moses and Elijah, I'll tell you why. Why do you think uh, people would think that Moses and Elijah were the two witnesses? Look what the Bible says here. In verse 6, it says, These witnesses have authority to close up the sky so it doesn't rain during their days of prophecy. Well, how long are they going to prophesy? 1,260 days. How long is that? 42 months. How long is that? Three and a half years. Well, you remember Elijah in the Old Testament when he faced off against the prophets of Baal up on the mountain. You remember how, and he prayed that it wouldn't rain. And you remember how long? Three and a half years. So you see that there, there's some irony here. There's some, some uh, coincidence a little bit. And I don't believe in coincidence, but that's, you know. So people think, well, maybe that's Elijah then. And why would it be Moses? Look at what else they says. They also, this is verse 6, they also have authority or have power over the waters to turn them into blood and strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. Well, who did that? Moses, right? When he went to Pharaoh to release the Israelites from bondage, release the people of God from bondage, see symbolically the bondage of sin and, and the persecution that comes from those who reject God. So, there's a lot of arguments that says, well, Moses and Elijah are your two witnesses, and they're going to prophesy in this particular place. Well, here's one uh, argument that was brought up against that. Well, could it really just be two individuals? Because it says the world, nations and languages and peoples, will see. So how, how's, how's the whole world going to see two people if they're in one spot? Well, when many of these reference guides were written you know what there wasn't no such thing as the internet and tv that's right so now because of television and the whole world wide web if i want to see what's going on in beirut when that bomb exploded a while back i can just pull it up and look at it live feed if I want to see what's happening in the un unrest in the Middle East, I can search it and find it. Live feed video. So that kind of makes you think, all right, well, now maybe you can. All Everybody in the whole world see what's going on in one spot. Uh, but, but that was one of several things that was mentioned. Well, this is probably not uh, the best understanding of the two witnesses. Now, I'm not going to tell you one way or the other because, quite frankly, I don't know. I don't know what's the best way to understand this. All I know is, in some form or fashion, there are going to be uh, either two individuals or two groups or several, uh, several people or thousands of people are represented, represented like this that are witnessing for the gospel. I know that. I know in some way, shape, or form, God's going to have His Word, His Gospel message uh, going to be preached and prophesied for a period of time, and He is going to protect the message from being uh, stopped. And, and it says here, uh, talking about how if anybody wants to harm, fire is going to come from their mouth. Well... That also could be symbolic. The judgment of God is signified by fire. So everybody who comes against uh, the message of the gospel could be judged by God. So, you know, there, there, there's a lot. You see what I'm talking about, uncertainty. You know, there's, there's no way to just pin this down and say, 
this is definitely what it's going to be and who it's going to be and then how it's going to look. But we do know that for the first three and a half years in this period, these two witnesses, there's going to be uh, prophesying, preaching, sharing of the gospel message. And so this particular commentator says, he says, with some reservations, this view should be fo- or could be followed the 1260-day period of protected prophesying by the two witnesses also synchronizes with the period of the woman in the desert that we're going to see in chapter 12 in Revelation. And when the death of the witnesses happens here in verse 7, uh, Revelation 11, 7, then that follows, the, there follows the 42-month uh, murderous reign of the beast, which is what we're going to see in chapter 13. It, you know, the first half, the 42 months of prophesying, then the witnesses die, and then after three and a half days, they're raised to life again, and God calls them up to heaven, and then there's another period of 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, where the reign of the beast is happening, and that synchronizes with the trampling down of the holy city that was mentioned in verse 2 of chapter 11, talking about the the courtyard that's going to be trampled down by the nations. So, There's a symbolic sense here that talks about a real period of time, but it understands the numbers describe a kind of period rather, it's like a kind of a period, not just a length of a period, if that makes sense. And so it's John, in his course of relaying this vision, he kind of goes in a pattern. And so the way he treats certain things is fairly consistent in the rest of of his vision. So... What we're reading here uh, is, is uh, there's a lot of symbolism. So when we get to the two witnesses, it's kind of hard to nail it down and say, well, it's these two guys, and they're standing in this place. Now, let me tell you another, uh, another part of this. Why is it um, difficult to see that it's going to be in one geographic location? Okay, so I want you to look at the text here <clears throat> because it says... Um, when the two witnesses have finished their testimony, this is verse 7, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war on them, conquer them, and kill them, and says their dead bodies will lie in the, the main street of the great city. And we start thinking, well, what's the great city? Okay. Well, then it says, uh, the main street of the great city, which figuratively or spiritually, and, and there's a word there, based on the, uh, the word, the same word for Holy Spirit, pneuma, uh, pneuma which is spirit, pneumatikos mean, is the Greek word here. It means uh, spiritually speaking, so not literally. Okay, I guess just understand it that way, not literally. But it says the great city, which is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Now, there's a problem there, right? Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, remember? Okay, Sodom is a city that was known for its rebellion against God, right? And, and God burned it to the ground, right? Well, Egypt's not a city. It's a country. So, so how does that factor in? Uh, where was the Lord crucified? Jerusalem. Okay, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, three different references just in this one verse. And it, but it said that great city, figuratively, Sodom, Egypt, Jerusalem. So what do those things have in common? Egypt was where the Israelites were in bondage, okay, slavery. Uh, Sodom was known for its wholesale rejection of God and sin and immorality, and God burned it to the ground and judged it. Uh, Jerusalem is where the religious establishment did not accept Christ as Messiah and had him killed, right? So there's all kinds, all of those uh, signify rebellion against God. So that's the common thread. That great city, that's why it says figuratively speaking or spiritually understood, it's not a specific location as much as it is uh, a condition. It's a condition of uh, rejection of God, rebellion against God. Okay? And so that's, that makes it even harder for us to understand. So uh, let, me, let, me, um, let me see if I can clarify this a little bit. Okay, so when we talk about where their bodies are going to lie, the main street of the great city, 
uh, and then some of the peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will view their bodies for three and a half days, not permit their bodies to be put into a tomb. Those who live on the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another. It's like Christmas. It's like a a pagan Christmas. They're going to celebrate and exchange gifts because this witness has been put down. The witness to the gospel. These two witnesses, their testimony has been uh, quenched, so to speak. But then look what it says at the end of verse 10. They're going to do all those things and celebrate like that because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. Now, if they're rebelling against God and they're rejecting that message, why are they being, why does it say they're being tormented? If they don't believe it, if they don't believe a message, it's like the atheist who gets so mad at a God he claims not to even believe in. I don't believe God exists. Well, why are you so upset about it? You know? You don't believe that God even exists, so why are you arguing about it? You should just move on with your life. But it says they were being tormented. See, that's but when the truth goes out. You remember what Romans 1 says? You remember when it says people, although they knew God, they didn't honor Him as God. They suppressed the truth in their unrighteousness. See, it's inconvenient for me to believe in God because that makes, messes up how I want to live. I want to live for myself, and so if I believe in God, that just destroys my whole plan. So I'm just not going to believe in God. So that's what we tell ourselves, right? That people tell themselves there's no God, but deep down, that truth is there. It's just being suppressed. So, so this is a, a representation of that. They're being tormented by this testimony because of a constant. Just think about it. 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, constantly preaching the gospel, telling the truth about Jesus to the unbeliever, to the, to the militant unbeliever. That's torment. Just getting assaulted with the truth every day, all the time, for three and a half years. That's what's happening. And so that's, what, that's why they're celebrating, okay? And so that's why also, uh, they, one of the, it says here in, in this one, one resource, it says, uh, they will gloat over the bodies of the dead witnesses and refuse them the dignity of burial. And it says here, to have your dead body lie in view of everyone was the worst humiliation a person could suffer from their enemies. And the pagan world is going to celebrate the destruction of the witnesses and the victory over them by exchanging gifts. And the beast that it talked about that accomplished this short-lived victory is going to silence the witness of the church to the glee of the beast-worshipping world. All those who have rejected Christ, they're going to celebrate because of what has happened. And so the time of the silence of the witnesses, three and a half days, corresponds in days to the time of their witness in years. They witnessed for three and a half years, they were silenced for three and a half days. And it's a, what it's showing us is that there's just a brief, brief time of triumph for the enemy. But it's, it's fleeting. It's temporary. It's, it's, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, it's nothing. So what happens after that? Here, here's the end, of the end of our passage tonight. After three and a half days, now can you imagine? Try to put yourself in the, I mean, this has got to be bad. You just got through with a three and a half day celebration. <laughs> you know, everything. Finally, they've sh- we've shut them up. We're, less, you know, we're exchanging gifts. We're having parties. We're celebrating. The witnesses have been silenced. After three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. And, and you notice this is, this is written in past tense. Not three, after three and a half days, the breath of God will enter them, but entered them past it they stood on their feet so left in the street dead for three and a half days and all of a sudden 
they stand up. <laughs> I can imagine that the parties came to a close right quick. You know, when these, when these witnesses stand up. And it says, they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. And see, right before that in verse 11, it said, great fear fell on those who saw them. So this, uh, all this scene, when the, the resurrection of the witnesses happens, they get called up to heaven, and then in verse 13 it says, at that moment there was a violent earthquake. A tenth of the city fell, 7,000 people were killed. But look at this next little sentence. This, this is one that's kind of perplexing. It says the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, isn't that interesting? These are the same ones who were partying because the witness from God had been silenced, and now they're so scared by what all has just happened, they give glory to the God of heaven, the one that they rejected, the one that they didn't believe. So that, that's, to me, that's, uh, that is very, very interesting and 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 also i should say uh carrying with this theme of symbolism in all these different events here in chapter 11 the death and the resurrection and the ascension of the two witnesses has a worldwide scope you know because says the world will see them then we can we can kind of make the next step here and say this earthquake the violent earthquake has a worldwide scope. And so, again, we don't know when it says a tenth of the city. Well, what city? Because remember it said Sodom, Egypt, Jerusalem. Uh, is it Rome? Is it Babylon? You know, the, all the great cities that were rebellious against God. What great city? Is it, is it everywhere that rebels against God? Is it unbelievers in general? You know, it's, it's hard, that's why it's hard to tell. But whatever it is, it's one-tenth of that fell and 7,000 people. So is it literally 7,000 people died? But if it's a violent earthquake with a worldwide scope, it may be, 7,000 might be symbolic of a, of a much greater number. We don't know. And it's okay not to know, we, but we don't know. But we know that's what the text says, that a major event, a major event happens. Now, I will tell you this. In the midst of all this um, commentary and research, this one particular commentator said that the events of Christ's return and the ascension of those witnesses seem to be simultaneous. And so that's an interesting thought, that at the end of the 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years of constant witness for Christ, and then there's three and a half days of silence when they're killed. And then they come back to life and God calls them up. At that moment, that ascension of those witnesses seems to correspond with the return of Christ. So when will that, how will that work out? When, when will that, I don't know. I don't know. But it just, the way it's written, the context of how it's written, and the, the theme that's working through this passage seems to indicate that that may be the case. So after all of this, violent earthquake, a tenth of the city fell, 7,000 people were killed, the survivors were terrified, they gave glory to the God of heaven. Now that's the end of the action. And then there's just one little sentence. Now the sixth, uh, or the second woe, I should say, because remember it was first, second, and third with the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets. So now the second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. And that's the only um, precursor we have to what happens beginning in verse 15, which is what we'll look at next time. The seventh trumpet is about to be blown. So as if all this wasn't, uh, this, this is almost like uh, everything up to this point is leading up to a major event that happens when that seventh trumpet is blown. And that because that contains... Uh, what we'll see, the seven bowls of God's wrath, which is coming next. So uh, I, I apologize for a lot of the uncertainty 
And, and the fact that we, you know, there's just so much we can, there's so much we can do, and then at that point we have to just say, but you know, uh, we know we know God can be trusted. So I don't know what it looks like. I don't know who exactly the two witnesses are, and I don't know where exactly they'll be. But we do know God's message is going to be proclaimed. We do know that. And in his, his I, I think this is probably the, maybe the, the best takeaway from this portion. God protects the proclamation of his gospel. You see that in the, the way these witnesses, whoever they are, wherever they are, the way they have been empowered. Uh, talking about fire coming out of their mouth. Anybody tries to hurt them. If anybody tries to interrupt what God has ordained as the proclamation of his message for that period of time, whatever it is, uh, he, it's not happening. Okay? God's going to protect what he wants to be declared to the world. And so, uh, how do we apply that to us? We have the gospel. We have the, uh, the mandate to share it. And God will protect us in that. Ho however that looks, God has empowered us to share his message. And he'll, he'll uh, watch over us as we do. All right, I was about to say any questions, but I said no. That would probably be a bad idea at this point. So, uh... It gives you something to think about, though, right? It gives you something to think about, something to talk about, and, and, and hopefully it'll give you more inspiration to go back and, and read the Word more and just kind of... Charles, you want to say something? <laughs> I know, a lot of things. Right. That's right. Exactly. Because, yeah, because last week we talked, it said a third of mankind was killed, right? So, yeah, the, the numbers are, are dwindling. Right. Yeah, and there's a lot of questions. Yeah, a lot, a lot of questions. But, that, and, that, and that's another a good, a good opportunity for us to say, you know, Thank God he's got it all handled, right? Thank God he's, he's, he's in charge and I'm not. He's got, that, he's got all the answers and, and he can be trusted with them. So, so that's good. Let, let me pray for us and uh, we'll be done. Lord, I thank you so much for this day. Thank you for being with us during this Bible study time. And uh, We admit, Lord, there's lots of things here in your word that uh, are difficult to comprehend and uh, many of them hard to understand. And we just want to, we want to read your word. We want to understand it uh, best we can by the power of your spirit who gives us the understanding. And then we want to apply this to our lives in a way that, uh, that we just want to do what you tell us to do and live according to your word. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us do that, even in the midst of, of this particular study that's uh, oftentimes becoming more and more difficult to comprehend and to grasp uh, we want to take from it and make sure we're living in a way that uh, honors you and, and we want to be found faithful in your eyes uh, regardless of what happens and when it happens and how it happens uh, we know you can be trusted and we want to be faithful to your call so help us to do that lord we pray in jesus name amen